<laughs> well, it's wonderful. I'm going to wait. I'm Pam, the executive director of the National Basketry Organization. And I'm going to wait while people are joining us and I can see the participant numbers increasing every second or two. So shortly we'll begin the program. Um, and if anybody's curious about my background while I chatter away, it's going to the Sun Road in Glacier National Park. It is the most magnificent place I've ever been. And I got there in 2019 and hope to go back again one day when it's safe. Yeah. Um, so we're already at 70 people just about. Wow. And there's Wonderful. already a question. The chat is disabled. Yes, I do mean the chat to be disabled because we find that it's distracting for these conversations. Um, but the so Q thank you for your open. question. The Q&A is open. Yes, but we do have the Q&A open and and so you're welcome, yeah. Wendy. That was a good question. Um, all right, well, I think we will begin. Let me Im introduce myself again for those of you who didn't hear me couple of minutes ago. Um, I want to welcome everybody to our fifth NBO Presents. I'm Pam Morton. I'm the Executive Director of the National Basketry Organization. We're excited to have you with us today. And this is Materiality, the Art of Repurposing. It's a discussion with David Chambers, Elizabeth Morissette, and Emily Devoren. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen for any questions. We'll be monitoring them throughout the program. And if we haven't answered them during the program, we will definitely get to them at the end during the Q&A time. As you can imagine, these webinars have a financial impact on MBO. I will be putting a donation link in the Q&A section, or you can just go to nationalbasketry.org and right on the homepage, there is a donate tab. We appreciate your donations of any amount. Thank you for joining us. And I will begin the intro slideshow. And I believe I'm going to be first. And there's always the black screen. <laughs> so Pam, maybe you should say what's gonna happen over the next few minutes. So each of our participants, David, Emily, and Elizabeth will just be giving a little background on who they are and their artwork and you'll be seeing slides from each of them. Okay. And I am now going to disappear until the end of this. Okay. So I'm first. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm David Chambers. Um, I live in Bellevue, Washington, which is just outside of Seattle. Um, I'm a retired aerospace engineer, been married for 37 years. I'm currently the vice president of the Northwest Basket Weavers. Thought I'd give them a little plug there. Uh, I started uh, making baskets almost 20 years ago by coiling pine needles. And I still coil with pine needles today. They're, they're beautiful to work with. But a few years ago, I started wanting to try to experiment with some stitches and things like this, things that weren't going to be a basket. And so I said, well, I don't want to waste my pine needles. What can I do? And I thought about, well, how about a rope? And so I went down to the hardware store. Didn't know that would be the first, only the first time I'd be there for basket materials. And I found some clothesline. 
and it was a, a bundle of 100 feet for three bucks. I said, that'll work. So I took it home and I started stitching with it. And I said, hey, this stuff is great. And so as you can see on the screen right now, I took that clothesline and I made it into a basket. I said, well, I can work with this stuff. So I started saying, what else can I use? Well, there's tubing. I, I tried to think of the craziest thing I could, which was steel cable, brought it home and played with it. And it just worked wonderful. And so from there, I just started thinking, well, what else can I do? And my process now is I, I go to the store, hardware store, office supply store, whatever. And I look around and I find pieces. And if I find something interesting, I bring it home, I play with it and I figure out what it'll do and what it won't do. And I start sketching ideas. And when I get enough together, I end up running back to the hardware store and actually seeing if they have all the pieces that I'm looking for. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So it's an, it's an iteration. I have to find parts that match my design. I have to change my design to match my parts. And when I finally get it all together, then I can sit down and start weaving. And so I guess one thing I wanna say about that is there's so many different things you can find out there. It's wonderful to play with. I like playing with hardware. I, I will say that I don't know how the hardware is finished, the residues and stuff. So I do clean my hands a lot, but I enjoy the challenge. And I'd like to encourage other people out there to, you know, just look for other things. And a funny shot, that is a picture of my studio right there. It's a chair and a footstool. So I'm not on the studio tour. So uh, that's enough for me. It's time for Emily. Hello, everybody. I'm Emily DeVoren. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area in Kentfield. Uh, here, this first picture is a picture of me in my studio. You can tell how full everything is, but very organized. I call myself a sculptural basket maker. My work focuses on transforming common materials into innovative urban vessels that reflect uh, abstract ideas, including societal excess and throwaway consumerism. I like to manipulate and construct and alter and coil and weave to develop pieces that marry modern aesthetic with childhood whimsy. I am very much playful. Um, I strive to give the viewer a process of discovery. What at first seems like conventional fibers may turn out to be subtle arrangements of oh, piano innards, shoulder pads, forks, curlers, spools, uh, refrigerator magnets, as you can see. Cable ties is one of the things that I use in almost everything. Uh, they are my signature these days. But I also am known to say that I believe anything can be basket material. My goal is to change the definition of basketry by exploring contemporary interpretations of this very traditional craft using very non-traditional ingredients. Uh, I approach the bas making of baskets the way I approach my life with innovation, irreverence, and a dash of humor. Over the years, I've learned to trust in the natural evolution of discovery and trial and error and the occasional perfect marriage of idea and execution. Some baskets seem to come together effortlessly while others challenge every corner of my aesthetic and engineering skills. I, as with everything that matters, there's a reverence and a satisfaction that comes from seeing a creation from start to finish. Like disparate notes that somehow manage to sing, my pieces represent the eternal truth that wonder can be found anywhere and everywhere as long as you remain open and determined to find it. I do call my work Transordinary Vessels. I would love to explain to you all the materials that are in each one of them because frankly, that is what matters to me most, the materials and the process. Uh, once it, it's like reading a good book, once you're getting to the end, you don't quite want it to finish, you don't want to let it go, it's very much the same process for me. It's, it's very much involvement in the piece and the materials that I'm working with. Picture frames, I assume. Yes. <laughs> All right, hello. Um, 
My name is Elizabeth Morissette, and I am a basket maker as well as a weaver. Um, I make baskets out of found objects, <clears throat> some of them that I find, some of them that other people find. Um, this is my studio, and it has some of the wall pieces and some of the baskets that I make. I normally make um, two. I make a wall hanging and a matching basket uh, with the materials I have left over, so my baskets vary in size. Um, and here's all my materials. I put them in, you know, those uh, big uh, pretzel boxes that you get from Costco. <laughs> I'm trying to get a whole bunch of those and, and that way I kind of can tell how much of each item I have and if I have enough to make a basket and a wall hanging. Um, this one is made out of textbook pages. Uh, pretty much I find stuff that's free or really, really cheap. Um, that comes from my roots in uh, college when I was wanting to make lots of things, big things, and I needed to kind of find a sustainable way to do that. Um, I went to college in North Carolina at the time that um, a lot of the textile companies were getting rid of a lot of their things. And so I found a lot of notions, um, lace and ribbon and um, started doing that crocheting and um, lots of different things. This one is credit cards that are pieced together using wire. Um, and a lot of times I'll be in the middle of piecing it together and the materials will tell me what shape they need to need to be. Um, I kind of try to listen to the materials as much as possible. Um, this is Easter eggs. This is called All My Eggs in One Basket. Um, and it's interesting because you keep finding the same things over and over. Uh, and once you've done a basket of it, you're like, okay, been there, done that. <laughs> um, yeah. But sometimes not. Uh, this piece is called Ball Game. It's all baseball cards to get, put together with staples. And that piece grew as I had a show um, and went in and worked on it once a week and just kind of kept building it and building it. People still bring me their baseball cards. <laughs> <laughs> um, this piece is made out of uh, wristbands that you get when you go to a concert. A local concert venue had a bunch of extra ones and called me and said, if you can be here in an hour, you can have them all. And I have them all. <laughs> um, this is a piece of coupons from a uh, PTA fundraiser that they saved for me and um, gave to me. I didn't ask them to, but they're like, we knew you could do something with this. And it's almost <laughs> like, here's the gauntlet. <laughs> what can you do? Right. Um, I spent an entire year working with zippers, trying to see the different things that they would do. And these are coiling techniques um, using um, uh, sewing, just hand sewing them together. And this has a wire armature on the inside to give it a little, mm. little bit of uh, space. And this is another zipper piece um, that I did, one of the first ones that I did. And uh, kind of looks like a little dude standing up, so. Yes, it does. <laughs> and sounds like the end. Yay. At this point, I just have to say how excited I am to have this conversation with Elizabeth and David uh, it's amazing to have uh, people who talk my same language because a lot of the art world I walk in look at me like I'm some kind of crazy. Uh, and it's so wonderful to talk the same language and be like-minded. I have uh, some questions that already uh, came about beforehand and I would like to start just asking us questions uh, and I will also monitor the uh, Q&A and see if there are any questions that come in, but maybe some of the, the answers will come as we answer our own questions here that we've lined up. And so the first question I think maybe we should dis discuss a little is, uh, what, if any, is your art education? Are you going to start, Emily? Um, okay, I'll go first. We'll kind of kind of do this in order and then uh, Elizabeth, and then David, how's that? Mm -hmm. So I don't have a formal art education. One of the things that uh, my resume or my CV is, is missing is any of those art classes, plenty of art exhibits. I came to um, basketry after uh, I explored macrame uh, and uh, don't have the formal training, but now teach it. Uh, I literally studied every basketry book I could after taking a class in the basement of the Academy of Sciences here in San Francisco uh, on kelp basketry. I don't know what made me take this one day workshop, but then I had that aha moment and have been making baskets ever since, but no formal training. 
Well, I have a lot of training. <laughs> I went to um, school design at North Carolina State University, um, learned how to weave there. And also uh, Barbara Schulman, one of the professors there taught me uh, some of the just basics of basketry, plating, coiling. Um, and uh, I kind of used that as a vocabulary um, to start making my baskets. And I also use that in the weaving as well. And then I got um, my master's degree from Maryland Institute College of Art in uh, community arts. And so I take a lot of community arts classes. Um, I use a lot of textiles in those because there's a lot of um, history in that. The, the Guise Bend quilters, um, just textiles can help build community I found in my experience. Um, my background, uh, I think high school was the last time I took an art class. So everything after that has just been on my own, just what excited me. Um, uh, I guess I've you know, always aspired to try to do something artistic. I saw it all the way through my engineering career, uh, but nothing formal. Um, you know, I, I made my first basket and that's just when this epiphany happened, I guess. I just went, oh my gosh, you know? And uh, if you look at my ba baskets, they're kind of challenging. And that's what I like. I'm an engineer. I like problem solving. So, you know, I just, I, I found a way to apply what I love to making baskets. And that's how I got here where I am today. Can you remember the first time you knew you were an artist? I found it very difficult to say that word for the longest time. I would, you know, have lots of other labels. Uh, mom, uh, you know, retailer, uh, a businesswoman, uh, you know, grandma, uh, cook, wife. And it really took me a while to say artist. Now, uh, I, I know David and I've had a lot of conversation about this where uh, there's a difference between craft and art, but I dance kind of on the cusp of those two things, I believe. And I'm uh, definitely, uh, as a retired person, a full-time artist, which was a dream. And I'm living that dream now. So I'm proud to call myself an artist. Nice. I think that's really powerful to be, once you name yourself, then, then you, you live into it a little bit. I think once you decide that that's what you are. Uh, my first memory of being an artist is when I was about eight or nine years old, living in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, a friend of mine and I took a bunch of yarn and wrapped up her, um, her swing set so much so that you couldn't see the swing set anymore. And the next morning, her mom called eight o'clock in the morning. She said, Elizabeth, get over here and, un and undo our, our uh, swing set. And I had as, a, as much fun undoing it as I did doing it. So looking back, that's where my whole basketry textile uh, roots are. I just, I loved it. And I love that kind of um, repetitive action and, um, and it's a good thing because <laughs> it helps. <laughs> um, I, I guess we've talked about this amongst ourselves too. I, I, I don't know if I call myself an artist. Um, I call myself a craftsman who makes art. And then I, I let other people call me an artist, even though it's incredibly flattering. And yeah, I should call myself an artist. I'm just kind of fearful to make that commitment, I guess. I'm not sure. Um, what else to say about that? Uh, you know, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I always seem to try to do artistic things, you know, just no matter what, even in my engineering career, I just tried to pull, put a little artistic flair into it. So I've, I've always had this desire. And uh, what's wonderful, I guess, is this baskets have really given me the opportunity to just really take off and, and do art. So that's where I'm at. Great. I see a bunch of questions coming in uh, from our audience. So I, I want to uh, interrupt for a second and answer some of them and um, then go on to the quest some more questions that we have. But there was a question about uh, dividing the dividing line between craft and art in as regards to basketry. And there was another question about, do we encounter resistance uh, because our work is non-traditional. And so I think those two are related. So let me see if we can kind of answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, basketry is a definite craft. However, as we three have in common, we have taken that traditional craft and stretched it. Uh, I believe that uh, 
we are using traditional techniques in the craft, but we have developed a, you know, kind of a one of a kind um, aesthetic that is definitely um, more art than craft in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how you two see it, but I would think that uh, there is, uh, there are times when uh, people uh, define basketry as, you know, reed woven, they, you know, from cost plus, <laughs> or whatever Costco or whatever your place is around where you live. Uh, and that's definitely craft. And what we do is definitely art. I don't know how you would you would address that. Well, I think it's important. Craftsmanship is important in <clears throat> any art. Um, if I go to a show and there's a piece of art that on a wall that that intrigues me and I get close and I see it's just put together with hot glue or you know, the craftsmanship isn't there, I'm no longer interested. Um, that's just me, that's my aesthetic, that's because I work so hard and take so much time and effort to do good craftsmanship in my pieces. Um, and it's kind of like, even if I don't like a piece, if I can see the craftsmanship, I can appreciate it. Yes, right. Um, so for me, every good piece of art has to have a, a, have a craftsmanship going on for it. And in that, anything that's well-crafted is artistic to me too. So that's blurring it even more. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know. Do I have to answer this question? I, I like to ask people what is art? And wow, do you get a lot of quite a lot of different answers to that one? I'm not even sure I know the right answer, but yeah, for, for me it's the same thing. If something is well done, I think of it as fine art, I guess, as opposed to just something that's put together so it can be used or um, and, and maybe, maybe what I'm doing is I'm envisioning the, the thought and the time and the effort that was put into making that. And I, that's valuable to me. And I, I, I look at that as art. And very few people are doing what we're doing with it. So it becomes a, becomes a, you know, a one of a kind or an unusual, you know, or unique, uh, piece rather than a, a repeated piece. Yeah. Makes it art. There's another interesting question, and I know we have others that we prepared, but here's one that's come through from our audience, which is, is there something about making vessels as important to each of you? And wow, yes. <laughs> for me, it's always a vessel. Uh, it's a, I had to think about it for a lot of years. I didn't quite understand it myself, why I was driven to make these vessels. It's, it's a container, it's a holder a holder of a story for me. I'm, I'm trying to tell some kind of story or give some kind of mood or feeling from it. And, and the vessel is perfect for me to hold that. Uh, and I've gone as years go by, gotten larger and larger because I guess I have more of a story to tell. Hey. The vessel is very important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the sculptural aspect. You know, I do the wall hangings that are more flat, although they're all three dimensional. Um, but when I move to the vessel um, that matches each one, it, it's more of a sculpture and it almost speaks for itself. Although they're matching pieces, it's like um, you've experienced the material enough that you kind of know what it can and can't do. Um, and another thing also with the vessels I found, sometimes I don't know what it'll do and it like collapses, you know, in like a couple of years or, you know, it's like, I do my best craftsmanship wise, but sometimes the materials let me down. I use the wrong material and I'm like, oh, should I should have used better wire, you know? It, so it's like a learning process more and, and it's living in a space too. And it's not, it doesn't have the wall to depend on to give it that structure. You have to give it that structure and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, we talked about a question like this the other day and, you know, why don't I do paintings? And, you know, I could just do a painting, you know, why am I doing baskets? And uh, it's the tactility of it, I think. I like working with my hands. I can push, pull, shape. Um, you know, I, I live with this thing, you know, for however long, usually months for me until I, I finish something. And it's, it's just that physical interaction that I find very exciting. 
you know, I, and, and in the end, I get to produce something. I get to hold it up. And if you want, you could put something in it. Most of mine are sculptural. I wouldn't recommend it, but, but uh, yeah, it's, it's that interaction with the piece and, and the fact that I can manipulate it with my hands when I'm working it, that makes me excited about doing baskets. That's really important. I think there's an aspect to uh, why I never became a painter which was that there was this paintbrush between my hand and the surface I was working on. <laughs> yeah. I really wanted to, to get into, you know, touching it, being with it. You, you got a great point there. Yeah, cool. Um, there's also um, just a couple of questions, how we're defining ourselves. I might as well ask this question uh, of, at this point, which is why it's key to each of us, why it's important that we call ourselves basket makers. Uh, and also in the there in one of the questions there was a commentary uh, or a comment on my com my uh, changing the definition of basketry. Well, um, when you say basket, people have a certain thing in mind, uh, and I definitely am connected to that. I'm a basket maker because I use the techniques. Mm -hmm. All basket makers. There's kind of a tradition. There's a history. There are you know grandmothers back way when I'm connected to who use those same techniques and those are basketry techniques. But I'm not, I'm changing the definition of basketry because I'm, as we all are, not using traditional materials. So the, the material aspect is way different for us, but the techniques are the same. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like, it's like painters, right? It's, um, their painting was considered a certain thing up to a point when abstract painters came in and changed it and made people upset and changed people's perspective. And now looking at it from here, we can say, okay, that's a painting and that's a painting and they're both paintings, you know? So it's, it's a genre and then we're kind of, we're mixing it up a little bit. And, and that's always kind of uncomfortable for some people and that's okay. I think it's okay and it's an art form. And especially since we're responding with um, materials from 2020, what does 2020 look like? What things are available? What materials are at hand for us to work for? And we're kind of telling a story about that in, in the vessels, just like the painters were doing, um, trying to talk about abstraction and then talking about their experiences as well. And I guess, you know, I, I'm drawn to making baskets. It's, um, you know, as you said, it's a vessel um, and I mentioned all the tactile stuff, but um, it, it's a goal for me. You know, it's, it's, I, I could put my stuff together and have a organic lump, you know, that would be fine. But the goal of a vessel, I, I want somebody else to call it a basket. Then I know I've, I've achieved what I was after. So I, I call myself a basket maker and, and hopefully other people call me the same thing, I guess, and not other names. So, um, and I, I, well, I don't think anybody calls me bad names, but I do get some strange looks from people when they see the materials I'm working with, but they always seem to like the end product. So I'm, I'm good with that. Totally. One of the questions from our audience is, uh, what do you tell people when asked, what is it for? I get that question a lot <laughs> because people assume, again, the definition of basketry, that it's utilitarian. And so the, hence each of us, I think, has used the term sculptural basket maker. So I, I sometimes yeah. ask people kind of facetiously if they are really insistent, uh, well, what do you use the sculpture for? Uh, and they get it, you know, kind of, like, oh, right. it's art. Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you guys react? <laughs> well, Emily, you and I have talked about how people always want to put them on their heads. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's just people wanting to understand. I mean, I, I think that the intentions are good, but then you're like, ah, don't put that on your head. Um, yeah, it's hard. I think, I think it's hard for people to think about art in their lives. You know, it's easier to think of a basket in their lives. I'll put some fruit in it or I'll, you know, I'll put it on the, I'll look at it or I'll put it on the wall. Um, so ours are different. They make Although they're, they're still the materials at hand, just like the reed baskets are materials at hand at that time, um, it's changing their perspective. And that's always hard to kind of change a paradigm in your, in your head. So, you know, we're, keep at it. People will get it. Yeah, you're right. People have preset ideas, you know, already, you know, 
it's not a basket because it doesn't look like what I think a basket should look mm -hmm. like. Um, I don't know if I get people asking me, what is it for? I've had people look at my metal baskets and say, well, you can't put water in it. And I'm right. thinking, why would you put water in a basket anyway? Um, <laughs> but uh, I've done some other art and uh, steampunk stuff where you know, I put stuff together and I made sculptures and people look at it and say, well, what does it do? And I go, it, it's a sculpture. It doesn't do anything. What, you know, same problem you, I guess, had, Emily. But yes, right. uh, uh, I haven't had people say that about my baskets yet. We'll see what happens in the future. <laughs> I do have a question here. And I would say, Cam, can you put us on speaker view? Because apparently uh, you can't see uh, all of our speaking. I don't know if you're hearing me, but we'll continue. Uh, I'm jumping in for a minute, just unmuting. I'm not getting feedback except from Dorothy that she can't see you. So I don't know what the problem is. Everybody else seems to be able to see you. Okay. Huh. All right. I'm muting. We'll keep going. <laughs> okay. So let's go to a couple more questions like, uh, what other artists inspire you? Um, I was back in the time of learning how to make baskets, teaching myself how to make baskets because I am basically self-taught, uh, looking all around and came across the artist called Ed Rossback, who did all kinds of newspaper stapled together pieces he called basketry in the 1950s and 60s. And I had that moment where he doesn't know this, never knew this, uh, he doesn't, he's not alive at this point, but he never knew that he, how he had inspired me, which was giving me permission to use yeah. any material I wanted yeah. to. And it was like, oh, I didn't have to, I didn't have to follow the traditional, I, I knew I was getting a, a handle on the techniques but I didn't have to follow that use of materials. So I looked around the world differently after looking at his baskets. Mm -hmm. Let me start to gather. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> that's all over. Basket maker, so we, how can we <laughs> gather? No, we gather. <laughs> right. Um, people who've inspired me, Nick Cave. I love his wearable art. I, he uses a lot of um, basketry techniques in his wearables and it's interesting because it takes basketry to another level. It takes it to this wearable performance art um, in the community, which is I'm really into. Um, Joyce Scott, like the bundle things, just like I bundled that swing set years ago. Um, and also there's an Austrian painter uh, who's passed away, Hunter Wasser, and I really love his color theory. He also makes um, uh, architecture out of mosaic tiles, like found objects, um, and makes it, wear, makes it usable for people. Um, so I really like, and I think maybe that's why I love baskets, is I like things that are, are you could have a use or have a use or are, are part of our everyday vernacular. Okay. Uh, the artists inspire me. The, the names that I can think of, when I started making pine needle baskets and I made my first basket and it was beautiful. It was this little craft basket. And I was really happy. And so I started looking at other pictures of pine needle baskets and I found some work by Lee Seip. And I was just really impressed with her work. It's very neat. It's very complicated. It's, it, it, it told me that I could take these pine needles and I could take them from a craft up to an art. And so I said, okay, that's, that's where I want to go. And so that pushed me to, to be more diligent and careful and, and, and just um, work harder on my, on my baskets. And then, you know, I started playing around with weird things like hardware and stuff and what are people going to think and I was looking through my book 500 baskets and there's an artist in there Rob Dob Dobson and he has baskets made out of hose and bolts and clamps and you know just different things and I said okay if he can do it that means I can do it it was it was I mean like I think you mentioned I, I, I had permission at that point to then expand I, I knew that I wouldn't be completely rejected by people who make baskets. And uh, so it was an eye-opening thing and, and, and really allowed me to head off in that direction. Right. So how about the question of how does your environment inspire you? 
Now, for me, I feel like I'm a historian, maybe archaeologist who looks around and any common ordinary material that's available to me, as you were talking about a little bit before, Elizabeth, as long as it's available in some quantity, you know, I, I am inspired by that material to go make something. And so my environment is very, very important. I'm, I'm just using what's available to me. I really don't uh, go out and buy any materials. I have uh, uh, these days I'm gifted uh, things. I will by my studio door, someone will leave, uh, you know, 200 uh, eyeglasses from the uh, movie theater in a big black bag. I won't even know who gave them to me. And it's, it'll sit in my studio and I'll go, oh, I can do something with that. Or it's, uh, someone's uh, friend's uh, daughter was uh, retiring from ballet dancing as she went off to college. And so uh, this friend said to me, you want the ballet slippers? Well, I'm always saying yes. Whatever material is around in my environment, I am trying to use. And that's fun. That's the fun part. Yeah, exactly. I, I find stuff in my, um, when I come home from <laughs> on my front step, just sitting there and I don't know who they're from. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, but one interesting thing I was thinking about with this question is over the years, my, the size of my studio has changed. And <laughs> almost every time, like one time I, I was like in a closet. I think my first studio was like in an, essentially a closet. And so I made teeny, teeny, tiny little pieces, teeny, tiny little weavings, teeny, tiny little baskets. And then I moved to a space that was an old um, school room. And then my pieces started getting huge. And like I had all this space and I had space to collect. And, um, and now I'm in kind of medium between those two. And um, my pieces are, are kind of medium. But also I do a lot of work. Um, I live in uh, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. I do a lot of traveling out West, which takes a long time to get anywhere. And so I started to work in the car and like always my pieces are about that big, about the size of my lap. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting how that happens. You don't really, it's not really something you think about until later when you look at it, you're like, well, of course, because I made that on that trip to Yellowstone or whatever. Um, so environment and materials kind of work together in that way. Uh, for me, my environment, maybe it's just my past and stuff, being a, being an engineer, you know, just working with parts and thinking about how things fit together. And I don't know, maybe led me to, you know, maybe more man-made materials. Um, but environment too. Um, I don't have a big house. Uh, my wife always says, if you're going to make a basket, make it small. <laughs> so nothing of mine is generally bigger than eight inches. You know, it's, it's either eight inches tall, eight, you know, it's, it's, but that's okay. It keeps me a little confined, you know, and, and doesn't let me run too wild. Someday, I hope to make a huge piece. We'll see what happens. Um, and Emily, uh, yeah, uh, you two both mentioned that you don't buy things, and I do, but that's something I have to look out for. I, one of the worst things is when I go to the hardware store and they have the perfect part. It's exactly what I want, but it's $1.50 each and I need 200 of them. It's like, oh, okay, back to the drawing board, you know, this ain't going to work. And so um, I, I love playing in the hardware stores, but I, yeah, since stuff isn't ending up on my porch and no, I don't really want bags to tell everybody of stuff, but um, I have to be cautious with the prices, you know, I, I have to be reasonable. I, I don't want to spend hundreds to make a basket. It's just, I, I want to find a better way or a different way to do it, if that's right. the case. Well, and it's tricky if you make a piece with found objects and then somebody commissions another one. Right. Ah, uh, good again. luck. Huh? It's like, I don't know what that was and I don't know how to find it again. So right. um, I find that very difficult to repeat a piece. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, uh, in any, I, I've had to do that for some commissions where I don't want it in blue, I want it in red. And I, I go back and I try to say, first of all, where did I get the materials? But secondly, <laughs> what was I thinking? How did I do this? You know, or right. to, to repeat it is very hard for me. I, I, all of my pieces are one of a kind. You know, uh, I, I don't like that repetitive aspect. Yeah, I, I find if I made a basket out of something, I, I'm done with it. I right. wanna, I wanna go, I wanna go do something well, else yeah. now. Yeah, right. on to the next adventure. A different challenge. Yeah, right. New adventure. Exactly. <laughs> well, speaking of challenges, so how has your work changed, if or, or not, during the pandemic? 
Uh, I find that, uh, interestingly enough, my work hasn't changed that much. I have used the uh, opportunity to continue to do my work. It's kind of my salvation getting through this time. And I, I searched you know, deeper into my everyday uh, things at home. So my first basket, which was in uh, part of the slides in the beginning, uh, during the pandemic was called, I called it stay home because it was made of plastic office trays that I had had in my office slash studio at home. And I searched in my ribbon collection from my gift wrap and wove with that. And so it's really been more to look at what I have rather than going to you know, and closer into me uh, than searching for what I don't have and using uh, what I have and actually using my art as a way of getting through this pandemic. Okay. Um, I started to, during the pandemic, I started to make face masks. Lots of people did and it was kind of a need right then. And um, I made a thousand of them. I just finished my last one, hopefully. Um, so I saved all the little scraps that you can't do anything with and uh, made them into these big, into these sculptural pieces, hundreds of them that I call antibodies. And I just did an installation of them at the Red Line in Denver. Um, and of course they're in like this spiral, like they look like a basket. <laughs> so, um, so I can't get too far away from that, but I've used a lot of the scraps. And then, so there's a lot of like mass kind of um, ideas. Um, I also did a mask out of zippers called Hunter Wasser face mask where I coiled it. Um, and it's wearable, but it's zippers. So it's super heavy and um, kind of scary. But, uh, <laughs> But I'm scared, you know, we're all scared and we're all kind of like, what the heck is this? And, um, yeah. and uh, so in a way, you know, art is therapy too. So um, whatever you're doing, as long as it's keeping you busy and, and not crazy, I think it's okay. Um, for me, uh, I guess what's changed most is just the interaction with other people face to face, you know, our group having meetings and, um, uh, I have a, I have a good friend who's a co basket maker Barbara Osborne. Hopefully she's on here. Hopefully a lot of people you know uh, know her already. And we, you know we get together and we we'd work. You know she'd work on her piece. I'd work on her and my piece. And so now we can't do that. But what we've started up is FaceTime. So I can sit here in my studio, my chair, and uh, Barbara can be at her house, and we can yak back and forth just like we're sitting across the table from each other. It's it actually is really nice, and it. It, it keeps that connection going. It keeps the brain working and inspiration. And uh, so uh, that's probably about the biggest change. I don't spend as much time going to stores and looking around because I just try not to do that now. But, um, you know, I, I'll zero in on a basket project like I have now and it'll take me several months. So someday maybe all this craziness will be over and, you know, I can go back to wandering stores. So. I got a question through our audience. Uh, do you find that young people are as open to using unique materials and forms as are us old hippies? <laughs> are you guys fearful that young people are not carrying on basketry? Well, actually, uh, I am encouraged that there are more young people coming into basketry because of people like us mm -hmm. who uh, I, I teach although I teach these days virtually, it's kind of hard, uh, much harder than, you know, teaching young kids uh, uh, with your hands and, you know, one-on-one -on -one real people. Uh, but I think that there are more young people attracted to basketry these days. I do not see it as a old hippie dying uh, craft at all. I think that especially with this kind of use of materials gives, gives kids uh, or young people a chance to explore it. I agree. Um, <clears throat> materials, you know, uh, I do have some baskets that I made uh, using lots of toys. And, um, <laughs> and it was kind of funny because they were kind of mad at me. <laughs> like, I can't believe you put that in a basket. I'm like, well, you know, what else was I supposed to do? It's an important Pokemon or anyway, I don't know what it is, but um, to them, it has this value, right? And it's like, and why did you do this? And how did you? And so it kind of starts that conversation and I find when you use materials that have other uses, like hair rollers or toys or zippers, 
it starts a conversation because everybody has some kind of a relationship with that material in one way or another. And, um, and you're just kind of taking it, putting it through a process and then having that conversation. And to me, that conversation is, is the important part. And um, kids get that. And maybe they just get it viscerally where they're like, that, I can't believe you put a hole in that toy and put it in a basket, you know? Um, but they, it, where, wherever you can get them, you know, wherever you can get them excited about it and, and to start thinking about, well, I have a bunch of toys at home that I don't play with. I could make those into an art. I'm like, you sure could, you sure could. And it's kind of like that, again, permission. Just as like it was important to us, we're giving permission to the next generation. And um, the more excited we can get them, the better. And anything is basket material, anything. <laughs> anything, you just have to be creative and patient enough. It might fall over in a couple of years, but anything. <laughs> uh, for me, um, I guess I've noticed, you know, real positive feedback from younger people. Um, I, I, I would say, but I'm not sure it's any more than people my age, older people. Um, maybe, maybe people more my age are probably more set. And if, if they're making baskets, they're more set in what they're doing. And my stuff's a little out there, which is fine. That's what I want to be. But uh, yeah, I get, I get positive comments from, from young people. Um, when I first got into my basketry guild, I started asking, I said, well, where are all the young people? And somebody told me they're too busy. It's us old people that have time to make baskets. <laughs> and I kind of thought about that for a while. Eh, it kind of makes sense in a way. Yeah. So. Right. I miss teaching. I do. Um, how about the question, how do you choose the names for your pieces? Uh. Well, so um, I like to have fun with my titles and I usually have a name before or during working on a piece so that I can kind of act it out or, you know, tell about it. That's part of the story. But it gives a little hint to a viewer later on as to what I was thinking. So yeah. you know, I, made, I made a basket uh, some uh, time ago called Big Fat Hairy Deal. It was made out of hair curlers. And so, you know, I was pretty flip about it. It was all the different kinds of hair curlers that I could find. Uh, it, it gives a little bit of a, um, a sense of what I'm thinking. You know, I, I use uh, sometimes the thesaurus to discover some words that are uh, illustrative of what I'm trying to say. Uh, the one of my latest baskets uh, is called she, and then she burst out dancing and it's very happy. Uh, so I, I use my titles to give that I, I do not love to see even in painters a lot of them that said uh, someone who says untitled number one. Uh, yeah, that's I, frustrating. That drives me a little <laughs> yeah, crazy. That's frustrating. So I like that. I, I enjoy the titles. Yeah. Me too. <clears throat> I like to um, to play with the titles too. Like if there's a word that, that has two different meanings, um, right. like I just did a piece called Thread Bear, but it's a it's a bear cub that I decorated with. Ah. So <laughs> B A R. <clears throat> as anyway, so um, that's fun. It's kind of like a crossword puzzle a little bit. Um, right. And sometimes like um, it's in, well, I'm working on something. Sometimes it's I wake up, I have a dream about it, and I'm like, oh, that's the title. Um, but I always like to give a little hint because there are some, some materials that I don't know about you, Emily, but that you use and you might not know what they are. <laughs> and you're just like, I'm using them. I'm That's right. Justice. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's like giving that hint um, to other people. Uh, for me, um, I guess I, I generally have like a working title. I don't know. It's just a, something going through my head. And it could be something stupid like, you know, box. I don't care. Um, but then what I love is, as I'm, I'm working on a piece and putting it together, all of a sudden a name will pop into my head. And if it makes me laugh, then I know I'm onto something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I want to be lighthearted about this. I, I love a name that adds something to the basket. You know, it makes you, oh, I look at it in that light. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it, it's something different. And so, uh, it's it's fun. I enjoy naming naming my pieces, especially when I just get that giggle. So, I think we all three have that in common. We where we we are having fun. Yeah, for sure. I notice you're here, Pam. 
<laughs> I am here. We still have another 10 minutes or so, but I wanted to make sure we address some of the other questions in the Q&A. So I thought I'd run through a few that are very specific and probably have shorter answers. Um, the first one from Anonymous is, Emily, what was the armature under the underneath the blue jeans piece? Okay, so uh, it was a cone from the vet that my dog had to wear. <laughs> the cone of shame. The cone of shame. <laughs> but it's also double, it's double layered. It's a two layered piece. So it stands, you know, much of it also stands up on its own. Nice. <laughs> and Martha wants to know, David, if you're represented by a gallery. Uh, no, I, uh, I've never sold a piece. I make a joke that the only only basket that anybody has from mine, they got it for a $1 raffle ticket. Um, but no, I, I put stuff in galleries and stuff. People don't buy it. I, I just don't expect to sell things. I mean, it's okay. I'm, I'm not here for the money. I'm here just to entertain myself. <laughs> okay, so how's this one? David, would you be willing to show us a page in your sketch planning oh, book? Oh, that must be Jill. Um, Anonymous, I, I, oh, I can't tell you. Oh, um, <laughs> They're not I, identified. I, I don't have anything I can bring up, but if it's people that know me, uh, my engineering background, my baskets are blueprinted out before I finish. And it's not exactly true. I, I love a pencil in my hand. So I sketch, sketch, sketch. And just working out all the numbers, the calculation. I, I even have graphs trying to figure out how things are going to vary, you know, as I put them together. But that's exciting to me. I just love that stuff. So I someday I'd love to display a basket along with the page that goes along with it. So you can, oh, there's the basket. I see it on, you know, there it is. It's down here in the bottom corner, but all the calculations are there. Mm -hmm. so. Dave, that is so awesome. I can't say as sketches have ever worked for me. It's, yeah, it's interesting. It's I, I hear people say that. Sketch does, and so I've literally put sketching aside, and I just let a basket evolve. I don't even know what it's going to look like. It just happens. So I, I'm I'm in awe of a person who who can actually make that engineering work exactly precisely like you. And I'm exactly the opposite. I'm in awe of somebody who can grab something and start putting it together and end up with. My mind doesn't work that way. I got to sit down and think it all through and wow. is it right and proportions and, but again, that's just my engineering background and I, you know, it's good for me. So. so here's one for Elizabeth. Could you describe the large installation of floor containers, colors, materials, armature? Sure. Um, that's a series of work I did after my graduate degree um, and it, they're villi and it's called the Digest series. And I did, I used my textbooks from school because you sell them back for like $5. Um, so I tore them into pieces, rolled them up, sewed them all, and then stapled them together and um, put beeswax on them. And um, they can be hung on the wall or they can be put on the floor. Uh, but there's a hundred in the series. And um, it's really neat when you put beeswax, like some of the pages, you know, were a little bit kind of thin and uh, when you put beeswax on them, it just makes them super sturdy um, and it makes the room smell fantastic. So um, it was kind of my way of um, digesting the process of graduate school. <laughs> Here's one I think from Anne to all of you. Do any of you teach your aspect of basketry? I do. I have um, uh, small workshops, one day workshops in my studio, anything from basic techniques to uh, my favorite class called Wacky Basketry. And that's the one where I teach uh, basically my philosophy, my approach to basketry. Um, I teach uh, workshops. I work for uh, the Museum of Art Fort Collins. I'm the education coordinator there. I teach a lot of basketry workshops there. And I'm going to be teaching an online course actually to make the, the paper vessels with the CAA conference in um, uh, February. So you can go online and, and take that class. I think you can take it for free um, in uh, February. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, funny enough, I, I teach pine needle coiling. So um, 
people have asked me about teaching, you know, stuff with, uh, but everything is so different that I do. It's like, you know, it, I haven't figured out how to teach wacky baskets yet. So, you know, I have to learn from Emily or something. Um, take the class. Yeah, take the class. That's what I need to do. Uh, pine needle coiling, no problem. I can, you know, I, I have fun teaching that, but no, nah, yeah, I, I probably need to think about it harder, but I, I don't know how to expand from there yet. So. So here's another one for you, David. How heavy are some of your pieces from Anne? Um, they only weigh maybe a pound, pound and a half. My latest one, I call it heavy metal just for fun because it is heavy. It's all metal. But uh, they're not, they're not, you know, pounds and pounds. They're, they're very reasonable. And also from Anne, Anne was busy writing questions. Emily, can you talk about the beautiful embroidery in some of your pieces? Were you young when you started embroidery? Uh, it was, yes. It was something that my grandmother taught me and I did it uh, uh, throughout my life and uh, I've always enjoyed it. So I love incorporating, it's nice that you noticed, I, it is incorporated into many of my pieces just because I very much enjoy it. Uh, and it's um, kind of one of those, uh, again, one of those techniques that I want to, uh, you know, in incorporate differently or use differently. So it's not uh, your traditional way of using it. So Sharon says, I'm so excited about the work by each of you. May we use your work as inspiration to explore use of recycled and or unusual materials? Please. Yes. Please. I encourage you to. Yes. Have fun. That's half the half of it. Is, that, that's is that's why I do what way. I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to try to encourage people to expand out. I, I guess a, a request if you if you're going to play with the pictures and do stuff, just you know leave our names on it so they know who's who. But <laughs> yeah, I I want uh, uh, that's what was it so enlightening to me is that I don't have to just use pine needles. I can use as Emily says anything, mm -hmm. and I, I just want to encourage people to do that. Play around. Absolutely. Well, and the interesting thing is if somebody uses the same materials we do, it's not going to look anything like what we make. Not at all. <laughs> I get Good that question a lot. Have a piece made out of hair curlers. I have a hair piece made out of hair curlers. They're exact, they're so different. So it's right. cool. Um, so Elizabeth, somebody wants to know what CAA stands for, please. College Art Association. And is there a website? Do you know what the website is? I think no. it's just okay. A, just look a, it up. Yeah. All right, College Art Association. Um, I'm trying to see Emily. Do you see any other questions that I you think need to be answered? Them. Um, I think we mostly answered them, and I wish that we had more time just with the th uh, each of us. I just enjoy talking with Elizabeth and David because, as I said in the beginning, not many people view it the way we do yeah it, it's so neat to to have your enthusiasm you know reflect my own enthusiasm in, in the way we look at things well i think we're about to conclude um i hope everybody enjoyed this as much as i did i want to thank david elizabeth and emily for their participation today especially for all the work they put into this program. This is our third time gathering. You all just didn't see the other two <laughs> earlier. Um, a recording of this program will be available sometime next week on our website, nationalbasketry.org. You can also donate to help support us putting on the NBO Presents program. There's a donate tab on the homepage. And we'll see you at our next NBO Presents program. I'm not going to tell you what it's going to be, but it's going to be wonderful. In January of 2021, thank you for joining us. And Elizabeth, Emily, and David, would you just stay on after we end the program for a few minutes? Thanks, everybody, for coming. Happy holidays. Have a wonderful, safe, and stay you know, well over this time. And Happy New Year. Thank you.